Hi, folks. Thank you for joining us in the Vermont Wild Kitchen. Tonight for our episode, we are going to be talking smoked lake trout as well as some garlic mustard pesto. It's quite a process. It does not lend itself to this format that well to do a live cooking show because it actually takes days to do. But um, I'll show you some of the kind of critical steps and, and walk you through the process. I think they're the best fish that we have in Vermont to smoke, and that's because they have a, a high oil content. Uh, pesto is one of those things that I think, A, goes well on just about anything, but I think would go especially well on some smoked trout um, or really any type of fish that you're going to be pulling out of the water here in Vermont. All right. Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us this evening in the Vermont Wild Kitchen. My name is Shane Rogers. I am coming to you live from my kitchen. I'm very excited to have with me today uh, Judd Crotzer, who is a fisheries biologist with Vermont Fish and Wildlife. Uh, tonight for our episode, we are going to be talking smoked lake trout as well as some garlic mustard pesto. So it is primed to be a nice wild episode on this sunny Thursday evening, and we're really excited to have you. As always, if you are tuning in for the first time, we welcome you to drop any comments, share any questions or stories, recipes in the chat. We'll, um, if you have any questions for Judd especially, please drop them in, and we're going to do our best to get those answered. If you have any experience with the wild edibles that we're talking about today, or if you have any amazing, wonderful Vermont fresh pears that might go well with smoked trout or the garlic mustard pesto, please feel free to drop this in. This whole entire show is good because you all are tuning in. So with that being said, I am going to throw it over to Judd, who's going to walk us through some smoked lake trout. Judd, thank you so much for joining us. We're excited to have you. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, everybody. I'm glad to be here. Um, I love uh, to eat fish and I love talking about eating fish and catching fish. So glad to be here. Um, yeah. And so smoking is a it's quite a process. It does not lend itself to this format that well to do a live cooking show because it actually takes days to do, but um, we'll, I'll, we'll, I'll show you some of the, the kind of critical steps and, and walk you through the process. The first step, of course, is to get the lake trout um, and to um, probably when you think about catching lake trout, you know, most people probably think about going out in boats and catching them. And that that is the way a lot of people catch them. And the reason for that is lake trout need cold water and so if you're thinking about summer fishing you're going to be fishing from a boat and you're going to be fishing deep so that does kind of limit the availability of lake trout to people that can be out on a boat but um, you can get them without a boat when there's cold water everywhere so that could be ice fishing season so ice fishing you don't need a you don't need the boat. You still need some special equipment, um, but you can go out and get them. And, and that's actually when I catch most of mine. And I will, if I don't catch a lot on a particular day, I might put them in the freezer and get them out because get them out later to smoke them. Because as I said, smoking is a process. So it's nice to have um, not, it's nice to not just have one fish to do this. You want a couple to make it worth the while. Yeah. But the other, yeah. The other time uh, that you can do this is actually right now, and you need even less equipment because you can actually catch them from shore. Um, at this time of year, the ice, um, well, the ice has gone pretty much across the state now, which is earlier than normal at this time of year um, in April. Usually we still have some ice up here in the Northeast Kingdom, um, but the water's still cold. And so those lake trout can go wherever they want in the water. And, um, and that quite often could be in the shallow water because that's where there is food. There's crayfish, there's small fish. And so you can go out with a rod and 
throw some spoons, some jigs. Um, a lot of people like to use dead smelt, um, and they'll just put those on the hook, throw them out as far as you can, and just wait for a lake trout to come by. So this is the time of year when lake trout can be more accessible to, to anybody uh, that doesn't have much equipment. Um, and how big are how big are the lake trout that people are pulling in from, say, like Lake Champlain off the shoreline this time of the year, do you think? Oh, uh, um, you know, the minimum length of for lake trout on Lake Champlain is only 15 inches. Um, but most of what people are going to be catching is probably well over 20 inches long, um, up to 30 inches. Um, so, you know, and you can measure those fish in pounds. So you're talking three pounds up to maybe eight pounds. So those are good sized fish. Um, many people feel that the smaller fish actually are better for eating. And, and, uh, yeah, I think, um, you know, the 18 to 24 inch range fish, I eat a lot in that range. Those are younger fish. Um, and, um, they, I think they probably do maybe, you know, taste better during using some other methods. Um, you certainly you can smoke those, but, um, um, yeah, the, some people prefer to eat those smaller fish. I, I think the bigger ones taste fine too, but, um, but the nice thing about eating the smaller fish though, is as I said, they're younger. Lake trout can live up to be at, over 40 years old. Um, so those bigger fish or those old fish that have been around a while, the younger fish, um, maybe you feel not quite so bad about harvesting a smaller, younger fish, letting those older ones continue to, to live and grow and reproduce. Um, yeah. Yeah. No matter what, they're a fun fish to bring in from what I, yeah. from what I've seen. I haven't pulled one in myself yet, but it's on the bucket list. And I should mention now too, one of the re the main reason I like to smoke lake trout, I think they're the best fish that we have in Vermont to smoke, and that's because they have a, a high oil content. Um, fish that are have more oil in them tend to do better on the smoker, and I think it's because that that oil content keeps them from getting dry. Uh, I have smoked bass, I've smoked uh, pike, northern pike, and it's okay, but Definitely lake trout and other trout species. Um, I prefer those on the smoker because of that oil content. Um, but um, yeah, so you've got your lake trout. Then you, you have to fillet it. Um, and so hopefully there's, you know, there's plenty of videos and other material out there. And I think even previous episodes on this uh, show, you probably have seen that. And if, folks, uh, yeah. and if folks are looking to learn how to fillet, there's a great episode where Corey Hart's fillet and perch, which would be a pretty similar process. Am I right? Yeah. Yep. Similar process is just dealing with a much bigger fish. <laughs> yeah. A lot more meat on there. Yeah. So once you get them filleted, then um, I put them in a, a tub with, the, with a brine. And there's lots of different recipes for brine. Um, uh, you, you included one there, I believe. Um, and, um, it's basically just water, salt, sugar, and maybe some other seasonings. And some people recommend leaving in the brine for just a couple hours. Um, I prefer going 24 hours to 48 hours. Um, and maybe it's just because lake trout are kind of a bigger fish. So your fillets are thicker. I like giving them a little more time. Um, and you just leave them in the fridge in that solution for that time. That's pretty easy. But again, it's a process. You have to start planning a couple days ahead. Um, once you get them out of the brine, then I, um, I actually put them in my smoker. The next step is to dry them. And there are different ways to, to dry the fillets. Uh, well, you get them out of the brine, you rinse them pat them dry with paper towels. And then some people will put them on racks, like, you know, cookie cooling racks, and maybe put them in the re If you're gonna do that, it's probably gonna get to dry um, because you're not getting the air circulation. What I do is I will show you my, um, 
I'm going to turn this around and show my, uh, oops, my smoker to show what I do. All right. So all right, look at that. This is, this is the part of my most of my smoker anyway. The other part is here. I already have the charcoal going. You can see that's about ready. Um, and um, but anyway, um, I guess I should explain the smoker at this point too. So this is a a vertical water smoker. Um, so you've got the bottom part where the charcoal goes. Uh, I'm going to put the, um, the water in here that needs to be hot. So that, that is hot. It's inside. And then this is the top part of the smoker and I've got the fish right down in there. Um, and what I do is to dry them, I will actually put my meat on the racks of my uh, smoker and then I put a small fan and uh, just let that fan blow and I had I put these out at about eight o'clock this morning and I had the fan on them until about a half hour ago and these are these are what they should look like um, what you're looking to develop it's called the pellicle it's um, it's a coating that gets on dry meat. They talk about the pellicle if you're smoking chicken or uh, pork, I believe too. Um, not sure if you can quite see it, but there's a little bit of an iridescent shine on these fillets. Um, it might not, you might not be able to see it through the camera, but when I touch them, they feel tacky. Uh, and that's the way it's supposed to be. The, the pellicle I don't totally understand it, but I think the idea is that that sticky, that tacky surface there grabs the smoke molecules. You know, something like that. The smoke's nice because it's the temperature outside, um, and there's no flies yet. Um, but um, in the winter, if it's below freezing, I'll try to do it in my basement where it's nice and cool. Um, and in the summer, if there's a bunch of flies buzzing around, then, yeah, I have to either do it in the basement or um, find a way to keep the flies off of it. Um, so, yeah, so I got those dry. And um, in the smoker, I've got the charcoal going. I took the water that I'm going to put in that pan is actually the brine that I had soaked the fish in. And because, um, because I only have so much burn time on the charcoal, you want to get your, the brine to basically the boiling point or close to it so that it's nice and hot. So when everything goes on there, the water's hot, the charcoal's hot, um, and you're going to get your, um, yeah, and you'll have the heat to, to, to smoke your fish. Um, all right. At do you this ever point, have to add more? Do you ever have to add more charcoal or anything in your smoker? Um, I haven't. Um, I'm get I get about three to four hours of burn doing this, and that's sufficient uh, with with this method. Um, I have heard of people trying to you know put new charcoal in, but that it gives that load of charcoal will give me what I need to get through this. Cool. I know uh, I just built uh, a smoker myself and I do not get that long of a, of a burn on my charcoal or my wood. So hmm. I'll have to be adjusting a little bit to your recommendations here. All right. But right now I'm going to go get the brine. I'm going to have my lovely assistant take the camera and um, so she can show me doing some of this. Oh, here she comes. All right. Thank you. No, the microphone didn't actually work. Okay, so we've got our nice hot brine right here. Um, the only other thing I didn't do yet, which now is a good time to do it, is I'm going to add the wood. So you can... I've used um, hardwood pellets from my pellet stove. I I've used just um, cuttings from apple trees when I'm pruning them. 
this this is the first time I'm going to try this. This is some uh, butternut that uh, I was use. I made a project for my son at a butternut, and I smelled it, and it smelled really good, and it seemed like a good wood to, to use for a smoke. I have heard that um, you can use just about any uh, hardwood uh, for smoking. So I'm going to throw some of this in there, and this is going to produce our. Uh, smoke you get some smoke out of the charcoal but um but adding some wood chips or or wood pellets will give you um give you some more smoke in there And so I'm putting in some different size pieces. The smaller pieces obviously will burn quicker. And um, bigger pieces will take longer. Yeah. I'll just do one more here. And then my smoker comes with this, which... I assume is to put the water tower or the, the water pot on. So that's what I do. I put that down. I'm just going to take my steaming hot brine, pour it in my water pan. Yum. Put that on there without burning myself. And just put it together. And then I'll just, uh, I'll just wait for three or four hours. I, I look, I make sure that my water hasn't boiled off about every hour. I check the temperature about every hour. I, um, in the instructions that I gave you, it lists, it says what the temperature should be. My thermometer doesn't necessarily think it's broken, but I make sure that it's reading what it typically reads. Um, and that's pretty much it. It's just, now it's just a waiting, a waiting process. A waiting process for something that's going to be so, so wonderfully delicious too. And we yeah. will, we will add Judd's recipe to the chat here, uh, following the episode. It's going to be attached as a, as a nice JPEG and PDF, but there's lots of great insight there. And Judd, uh, you know, how much, how much fish do you have in there about right now? Like how many pounds do you think you're smoking? Um, <laughs> I was going to see if I can get the smoker in the picture. Um, you got it. It's nice framed very well. <laughs> um, it, it was two big fish. Um, these actually, <laughs> I didn't catch these. These actually were given to me by Dave Gibson, who's another um, Vermont Fish and Wildlife employee. Um, he had caught these. I, I don't know if he had these from the winter or, or when he got them, uh, but they were both about um, in the 28-inch range. So these were pretty good-sized fish. I figure I have about, um, I think I probably have about, five or six pounds of meat in there right now. Wow. Uh, yeah. 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 And so, that's awesome. um, I'm getting too much of the smoke there. The smoke actually does smell good, <laughs> but I don't want to breathe it. Um, it, uh, what was I going to say? Um, yeah. So I do a big batch because it's a lot, it's, not necessarily hard work, but you need to plan it and make it happen. Um, and so usually I'll plan it so that we can have it hot for a meal um, that that day. And then I usually have a bunch and, and I'll freeze it. I'll put it in vacuum sealed packages and, and freeze it. And it, it keeps well like that. Wonderful. That's amazing. And folks, you know, Vermont Fish and Wildlife in the chat, they just dropped a link about when and where. Well, I guess not. 
you can see what has been stocked. It doesn't tell you when anymore, uh, when they're actually stocking. But um, also, I think it's important to note that trout season officially opened for our rivers and brooks and streams. And you can get out there and start looking for uh, other trout as well, which would be a really good fish to smoke, as, as Judd was saying. Is there anything else that you wanted to add, Judd, before we move on over? Um, I guess the only other thing, um, the, as I talked about the oiliness of lake trout, um, they um, oil, fish that are have a higher oil content tend to have a higher omega-3 fatty acid content as well. John, you're cutting in and out on my end. So I think I think what I'm going to do here is I'm going to transfer over. And you were saying that, you know, fish in general are pretty healthy protein here in Vermont that is pretty accessible for folks. And I think one of the I think one of the the nice things about being able to go fish out there is that there's so many resources. Vermont Fish and Wildlife has videos. If you haven't done this before, there's people like Judd and others who are willing to take folks out, show them what they're doing, or just answer any questions. So if you all have any good questions, feel free to continue to drop them in the chat. I think for our next section of the Vermont Wild Kitchen, <clears throat> as Judd's fish sits there and smokes away, uh, and those tantalizing smells that only he gets to enjoy at this time, we're going to switch over to my kitchen, where I am going to be showing you all how to make some garlic mustard pesto. And I don't know about you, Judd, but uh, pesto is one of those things that I think, A, goes well on just about anything, but I think would go especially well on some smoked trout um, or really any type of fish that you're going to be pulling out of the water here in Vermont over the next couple months. I just made, a, I just made some fish tacos with some black crappie that I caught uh, recently and had the pesto on it. And it was absolutely wonderful. So now normally folks, when they think about pesto, they think about basil, they think about pine nuts, they think about Parmesan cheese and olive oil and lemon. And while that basil, while that pesto is absolutely amazing, uh, one of my favorite things about pesto is that you can make it with just about any type of leafy green. And after a very long winter, especially this past winter, I have been particularly jazzed and excited to be able to get back outside and to really just start collecting some of those wonderful greens that are starting to pop up all throughout the state. And one of those greens and one of my favorite tall tale signs that it is spring is garlic mustard. And the beautiful thing about garlic mustard is that it is considered a weed or some folks call it invasive and you have no possibility of over harvesting this wonderful, very kind of bitter and just very tasty green. Now, for folks who don't know what garlic mustard is or what you're looking for, it tends to grow in partially shaded areas. It likes to grow under deciduous trees. I found this garlic mustard earlier today. I went out in the rain um, in the park in Richmond and I found it. There's plenty of it down by the goalposts, um, the soccer goals. Um, but like I said, it grows prolifically. You're not going to worry about over harvesting it. Uh, so when you're looking for it during its first year, um, it really has this distinct heart rosette shape or kind of that kidney shape. You can see that the veins of it are a web like structure. It tends to grow low to the ground and will shoot up to about two to four feet even. And as it goes throughout the season, Another way to be able to tell what you're looking at is it grows this flower that has and kind of looks like a head of broccoli or bro broccoli rob. And what ends up coming out is this little uh, four leaf white flower that is actually pretty, pretty to look at. Uh, so again, one of, these are one of my favorite first of the season wildcrafting uh, plants to find here in the season. And if uh, folks are interested in learning more, I'm going to drop a link in the chat to be able to go out and ID it. And I think the, oh, of course, the biggest thing to know about garlic mustard is that when you harvest it and when you break it, 
not surprisingly, it ends up smelling like garlic and mustard. And that's going to be one of your telltale signs that you ID'd this correctly. So like I said, I went out this afternoon. I collected a big handful of garlic mustard uh, with anything like leafy and green, just like what you would do with stuff coming from the store. Give this a quick wash. I put it in my basket, washed it off, gave it a quick spin. Uh, you'll see when you go to harvest it that it comes with lots of big stems. Some folks end up picking off all the leaves and all the stems, but for the pesto, honestly, it's okay to have some of the stems. I just kind of shucked it off and uh, ended up throwing it in here. So like any pesto, if y'all are familiar, what the base is is your leafy green. So if you take your food processor, and I have our little one right here that works really well, you're going to kind of just shove that full of your leafy green. And what you're going to be adding into it are all the same ingredients that you would for a regular pesto. So I mentioned pine nuts, and that's what's traditionally used in pesto. But I think uh, one of the beautiful things is that you can make pesto with any of your favorite nuts. I tend to like cashews or walnuts, which I just picked up in the bulk aisle, or you can pick up in a bag. Uh, the other beautiful thing about making pesto is that there isn't much need for a lot of measuring. I kind of fill this up. I put in the amount of nuts that I think I would like or want. You can always add more at the end. And we're also gonna give a nice big squeeze of lemon juice. So for this size of a food processor, I tend to use about a half a lemon. And that juice that gets produced is pretty enough to make a nice like acidic taste in there. And as we get that lemon in there, you're just going to squeeze that around. Again, this is all a personal preference type of dish. So you can make it to however you feel and see fit. If you want to use another citrus, I've made pesto, I think, with oranges before. I can't remember if it was actually that good. So I would definitely recommend some, some lemon. But really anything acidic will do the trick. Make sure you add some salt in there. Again, it's a personal preference. Add some cracked black pepper. And, uh, you know, for pesto, traditionally, uh, folks will add some Parmesan cheese. So I grated a little bit of that before. And the cheese, again, is just something of personal preference, right? I also really like to add for the pesto um, some cheddar cheese in there. It kind of gives this this uh, nice, uh, a little bit like more of a gelatinous consistency. And you can really add any of the amazing Vermont cheeses that you find if you are willing to put them into a pesto. I use the Cabot cheddar, which, uh, you know, I feel like everybody has a brick of that if they like cheese in their fridge. So once you get this um, all set up, you're going to go ahead and you're going to add the olive oil. Now you're gonna use a healthy dose of olive oil here because your whole goal is to try to make and emulsify what you know a traditional dipping sauce and pesto would look like. And it is really as simple as that. Now, uh, when you get that all set up, you're gonna throw it on your food processor. You're gonna give that a blast until it gets to the consistency that you look like. And when that happens, you're gonna end up getting this beautiful delicious with the TV magic, uh, uh, nice fragrant pesto. I see someone say they like to add spinach and pesto too. I really love this pesto recipe because it is so adaptable. I think my favorite type of pesto to make are garlic scape pesto when the garlic scapes start popping in the garden or you see them at the farmer's market. I am putting a recipe right now that you can adapt to. My one suggestion for this garlic mustard pesto is it does taste a little bit bitter. And what I ended up doing after making it last week is I added a little bit of wonderful Vermont maple syrup to it and some Vermont apple cider vinegar, which kind of mellowed it out. And then as it sat for a day or two, the flavors just all melded together into this just beautiful, delicious, wonderful pesto that you can put on your um, smoked fish. You can put it on your fish tacos. We put it on some pasta. It goes well on pizza. And the best part about it is that it is all collected from 
the woods outside or where you're going on a walk. So, folks, that is our show today. It's nice and short and sweet. Um, moving forward, we're going to be continuing to do the Vermont Wild Kitchen every Thursday, uh, at every third Thursday of the month at 5 p.m. We're going to have some amazing guests coming up here, just like Judd, with expertise in fishing and hunting, as well as folks like myself who are just exploring what it means to eat wild edibles in the kitchen. And I know we have a question of, can we see Judd's final product? And I know, Judd, you said that it's going to take like three to four hours. So what we'll do is we can maybe post a photo at the end that can live in, that can, that can live on the comment section here once it's all up and done. But I promise you that it is going to taste and be amazing. Uh, so folks, again, we hope you tune in uh, to the Vermont Wild Kitchen every third Thursday of the month. And we are uh, always looking for folks to share their recipes. So please feel free to share your recipes with us or your photos using uh, the VT Wild Kitchen hashtag on Instagram. And Judd, did you have anything that you wanted to close out with before we end the program for today? Um, I guess I, I could just say, you know, that I did think maybe I should have dug some out of the freezer to, to show the finished product. Um, but yeah, we can send a picture what it'll look like is, you know, the flays that you saw there, they'll look a little bit smaller because they, they do dry out a bit and they, so they'll shrink up a little bit. They'll take on a, a darker color. They'll, they'll take on a brown color. Um, and, you know, if, if it's in there and you've, you've got the right temperature um, for three to four hours, it'll be done and it'll just, it'll just flake apart. Uh, it'll look like um, it'll look like a lot like uh, smoked trout that you might have got at the store, um, and, and it, yeah, it'll 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 be it, it'll look like you want to eat it for sure, and it and it tastes great. So I, I was starting to talk about omega threes. Lake trout are one of the highest sources of omega three fatty acids that we have of fish in our state uh, because of their high oil content. Um, the other way, if you really wanted to get some omega-3s in you, would be to eat fish roe. That's the eggs. Um, and that's something I've, I've actually been smoking fish roe um, in the winter. I harvest a lot of yellow perch, and they, uh, a, a yellow perch will have a nice big uh, sack of roe in there, a female will. And um, I will put those on the smoker when I'm doing my lake trout. And... Um, yeah. And, and those are, are good. Um, I don't know anybody else that's doing it, but everybody else that has tried it has liked it. I, I, um, I put it on crackers typically. Um, and maybe I just like it because I feel like a king or something because I'm eating – I feel like I'm eating caviar even though it's just perch roe. Um, it's, the North, it's the Northeast Kingdom caviar, Judd. You're, you're creating a new – a whole new movement and brand of food here. That sounds amazing. Um, but yeah, so fish eggs have a lot of fatty acids in them. So that's another great source for omega-3s. Awesome. Well, Judd, we are so thankful for your expertise and for you being on today and for showing us how to go about, you know, having a delicious meal from some of the resources here. And again, folks, I encourage you to think about what amazing Vermont food, you know, goes well with some of these. Uh, CSA subscriptions are open our farmers are working really hard to, to, to be able to tend the land and we're all, we're all finding food together. So with that, we're going to wish you good night and we look forward to seeing you all next month on the third Thursday of the month. So thanks for joining us in the Vermont wild kitchen. We will talk to you soon.